tell me when I can go. Oh, there it is. There it is. Got it. Hit the go. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abby Dykehouse. Um, and as Tara uh, introduced me a little bit, I'm a uh, part of the San Francisco, Northern California chapter with Madison. And uh, I am here today to talk to you uh, a little bit about dementia. Um, and my background is as such, I am uh, a social worker, a licensed clinical social worker. And I have worked in many different silos of the, the aging world. I started out in government. I worked um, with MSSP, which is Multipurpose Senior Services Program with Adult Protective Services. Um, so working, doing a lot of home visits, seeing the low SES population. Then I moved into hospitals, right? So I became a medical clinical social worker. I saw uh, a lot of people in acute moments in their lives, um, usually when some sort of medical diagnosis uh, happened or a fall. Um, and then I moved into hospice. And then I, I worked for um, a, a dialysis company. It worked with uh, doing therapy for end of life individuals. And throughout my, my professional journey, um, I, I just, I noticed that families come into these spaces so overwhelmed when, when people have a loved one that's that's aging and it can be so complex to navigate. And um, as a social worker in those individual silos, a lot of times I had um, very specific parameters on how I could help those individuals. And if it was out of those parameters, not in that scope, I would say, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I, I cannot help you um, find a wheelchair for your mom or find a neurologist. That's not in my scope. Here's a brochure, here's a phone number call. And um, usually when they'd circle back around to me, uh, the, the tasks that we had talked about usually didn't get done. So I created my own company, um, a, an aging care management company to help with everything. Um, and my motto is I don't say no. Um, anything that they need help with, right? Um, from finding that specialty doctor to working with insurance providers to, to getting people on uh, aid and attendance for VA, everything. I have a, a network of wonderful resources like yourselves. Um, and again, I always like to say, please contact me. I'm always looking for um, wonderful connections uh, in the aging community. Um, but again, I'm an all-encompassing aging care manager. And so with all of that said, a lot of times I have families that uh, come to me when there are issues with memory loss. Um, you know, mom has forgotten how to get home on a few occasions from the grocery store or dad got into a, um, you know, a, a car accident um, and we think there's something going on. Is it time to take away the keys? Um, and so I, I help navigate and educate uh, my families when we're in this space of um, this early onset, what we call um, mild cognitive impairment. So MCI is, is mild cognitive impairment. That's the stepping stone before you get to uh, an official diagnosis of dementia. And a lot of times, uh, if we start to see early signs of, of memory loss, which I'll get to in a minute, um, this means that perhaps they are not in that full-blown dementia diagnosis yet. It is actually the stepping stone before that's called mild cognitive behavioral impairment. And that's where we want to get those loved ones, those individuals in to see a doctor. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with everyone real quick. I made a little PowerPoint today. Desktop. Okay. Um, and again, um, mild cognitive impairment is, is that stepping stone to dementia. And dementia is a, a broad umbrella term. Um, and that has multiple different diagnoses under dementia. So uh, a, a lot of individuals are often confused. They say, you know, what, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's or dementia and Lewy body? Well, 
Um, Lewy body and Alzheimer's are types of dementia. Dementia is really that all encompassing big broad term that we use that when, when there is a, a diagnosis of, of something that has memory impairment. Um, and again, I'm having a little hard time, sorry. Maybe someone can walk me through uh, open system preferences. Why is it asking me to do that? Hold on. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I wish I could give you technical advice, but I'm not <laughs> I the person to do it. I just, I, oh, I click that little share screen button. That's right. My, I, that's what I, I was hoping it was going to be that easy. Um, let's see. Now, I guess I have to, uh, oh, there I go. I think I have to open something. De -de -de. Screen recording. Oh. Um, if you want to email it to me, I can try to share from this end too. Oh yeah, you want me to here? Let me just do that. Uh, okay, so I'll continue talking. Um, so again, for the sake of of this presentation, I really want to focus on looking at those potential precursors that will give you a clue to a loved one or uh, an individual that has mild cognitive behavioral impairment. And that is, again, uh, mostly aligned or correlated to Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is some a disease that we've all heard. It's, it's responsible for about 50 to 70% of all cases of dementia. Um, and, and again, Alzheimer's is a, a very uh, progressive disease in the brain that slowly causes impairment in memory and cognitive functioning. Tara, did you get it? No, did you send it to my Gmail? Yeah. Oh, it hasn't come through. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Oh, I think I just see it. Okay. Let me get it up for you. Great, thank you. Um, so again, when, when we're moving forward in, in the different signs that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute, again, I, I just want everyone to know that this really is uh, talking more specifically about the diagnosis of Alzheimer's and uh, not other lesser known dementias that may have very specific precursors. But again, uh, moving forward, I, I wanna give you four potential signs that you can look for. Um, and, and this is for the mild cognitive behavioral impairment that we often associate with the precursors to Alzheimer's. Um, thank you, Tara. So uh, just a little bit of what I just went over. Over 6 million people in the U.S. are living with dementia. Again, that's the broad umbrella term of any type of memory impairment. Um, one in three seniors dies of Alzheimer's and other related dementias. Um, and this number actually went up 17% during COVID because seniors were isolated. Um, and they weren't getting the, the medical treatment that they, they needed or, or the resources that they needed. So um, COVID really uh, shone a light on how needed it is for caretakers and family members to be aware of, of this disease. And again, uh, Alzheimer's is that specific dementia diagnosis that is responsible for about 50 to 70% of all cases of dementia. And then more than 80% of Americans know, um, know very little or are not familiar with what we're talking about today, which is mild cognitive impairment, which is that precursor to Alzheimer's. Okay, so here we go. The four common signs that I wanna talk about today of mild cognitive behavioral impairment, the, the number one sign that I often hear when I'm with my families is uh, loved ones have really started to, to 
withdrawal and that's communication. Um, and then forgetting how to do things. Uh, absolutely. We'll, we'll touch on that. Um, you know, basic, uh, basic processes that were easy for an individual to do, such as driving, um, are now complex to, to those individuals. Short-term memory loss, uh, and vision impairment is the last one that I'll talk about. So first one is uh, difficulty with communicating. So we often think of this as, uh, you know, a, a precursor to dementia, but I want to be very specific here that, um, you know, dementia or Alzheimer's, that is not a normal disease for aging. Um, our, our brains should not get to that, to, to dementia. Um, and, and oftentimes people say, oh, well, I have, I have memory loss. I can't really formulate words sometimes. So I must have uh, mild cognitive impairment or, or dementia. No, that's uh, forgetting words alone, just standalone forgetting words. Um, you know, we all have done it, no matter what our ages or our brain functioning levels, it's sometimes very hard to have that recall. Um, but we are looking for these different um, signs all together, kind of if you see multiple signs. Um, so it's just not not just forgetting words. Don't worry if you if you're forgetting words. It's it's not uh, just a, a direct line to, to dementia or mild cognitive behavioral impairment. But um, what I want you to to look for is also. Um, a loved one or an individual withdrawing from social situations because this is a definite sign that that individual is having a hard time in those moments where they're talking with individuals and they need the memory recall to, to really process information and have a fluid conversation. Individuals with mild cognitive impairment can have a, a very brief, short conversation. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. You know, how's your day going? It's great. Um, but if you start diving into the conversation a little bit deeper and say, well, did you see the news today? Um, I can't believe about Croatia crime, you know, um, then they have a hard time and you'll see them um, avoiding the conversation altogether. Um, and oftentimes you see a social withdrawal that is associated with the difficulty with communicating. Um, number two is forgetting how to do things. So again, this is um, a, a symptom of mild cognitive behavioral impairment that we we want to pair with with other signs. Um, you know, if they are having difficulty communicating and we are seeing that they're having a hard time doing somewhat complex processes like uh, managing their medications. If we start to notice that the, you know, their, their medications are not being taken um, or managing finances is often a, a very huge red flag um, and driving. So these, these tasks that a loved one or an individual or a client was able to do before, no problem on their own. And now we start to see um, that they have potential issues completing the tasks. Um, also, another piece of this is uh, noticing that they don't uh, engage in their hobbies anymore. Uh, an, an individual that used to love to play tennis two times a week and isn't going, um, or uh, someone that loved to cook. Um, if, if you see these signs that they're withdrawing from their hobbies that once gave them joy and purpose, um, it could be a sign of mild cognitive behavioral impairment because they are um, no longer able to become task oriented and do things with steps. All right, so let's go down to number two and I mean three and four. Um, so short term memory loss. Uh, this also again is is a, a sign and a symptom of that those early stages of, of Alzheimer's. Um, and and it's short term. So interestingly, the brain stores 
uh, long-term memories, these memories that we've had for years and years, you know, uh, thinking back to our childhood, uh, our childhood home, um, and, and what we what we love for breakfast every morning. These are stored in a very different place in our brain than the short-term memories where you and I are talking right now, we're having a conversation and the information is going into my brain and being processed in a very different part of the brain than those long-term memories. And so uh, the short-term memory, which is in the frontal temporal lobes, this is where we start to see a lot of the atrophy um, in Alzheimer's, in, in dementia. And so the, the short-term memory processing is hindered. So this is where we see you have a conversation with someone and then three minutes later, you go back and say, hey, you know, mom, do you remember what we talked about three minutes ago? And um, they will not have been able to process that information. The fourth one, this one always is um, uh, somewhat new to, to most people, uh, and it's vision impairment. Um, again, as the brain starts to atrophy with mild cognitive impairment, we do see issues with balance starting to emerge uh, as the disease slowly progresses. Um, and it is hard for an individual that has any type of cognitive impairment to um, really be able to judge the, the distance or the range of things. So um, if the gait starts to become altered um, or you see someone you know, starting to grab onto things to help with their balance, that could potentially be a sign of um, this MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Um, and again, those are four um, you know, signs of, of what I want you to, to be looking for. And, and those need to also be somewhat together. There needs to be two or three of those signs that are starting to pop up um, in succession. And, and then uh, to wrap up this little presentation, I do want to say it is very important to note that it can be hard to tell between age-related forgetfulness and dementia, right? Like what I was saying, um, the the recall of you know when you uh, uh, what's that word? What's that word? That again doesn't mean you have mild cognitive impairment. It means maybe you didn't have uh, enough sleep last night. Or um, some of these symptoms also could be uh, signs of depression. Depression also has uh, a lot of parallel symptoms from with with dementia, um, and then of course uh, an in, uh, an acute infection and dementia. Um, if someone has, for example, a UTI, oftentimes these signs and symptoms can present uh, usually with acute uh, onset, so very fast. But it is very important if if you start to notice these signs in your clients and your loved ones uh, to really refer them first to their primary care doctor and then their primary care doctor will refer them to a specialty doctor, usually a neurologist. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Tara, my lovely assistant. <laughs> um, okay, do, do you want to open it up to questions? I'm more than happy to, if, if anyone has any questions, you can write them in the chat and I can answer them. Um, Yes, I see Carolyn ask if we could get a copy of what's on the screen. I'll be happy to send that now that I have a copy. I can send <laughs> yes. that along with um, the recording that we send out to everyone that registered. Yeah. So I'm happy to do that. And all of the data that's on the screen um, is from Alzheimer's Association, right? So that's my go-to resource. Um, you know, no, uh, they're a tried and true, very trusted uh, nonprofit organization. Yeah. <laughs> Not YouTube. <laughs> Not YouTube. <laughs> um, I, I found it interesting, the visual impairment. I never thought about that part of memory loss and dementia before. So I learned something new today. Yeah, that one is often um, something that, that people don't know about. The other ones are, are a little more obvious and you've heard it before, but vision impairment is often correlated with those beginning signs of, of memory decline and, and brain atrophy. Well, does anyone have any questions? 
Well, we have Abby about this or anything. I see Carolyn unmuted. Yes. Well, you know, when you're talking about vision, I always found it interesting. I know, you know, Parkinson's is a form of dementia. And they say one of the signs, first signs of uh, Parkinson's is their handwriting gets small. Mm -hmm. I never knew that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I did put it in the chat, but uh, since I'm chatting myself, um, we are starting up a caregiver support group down here in South Orange County. And we're looking for a moderator. I know that everybody's sort of all over the place, but if you know of anybody, um, you know, like what Abby is in, in her organizations of care management, a lot of times those people are, are good moderators because they have such a wealth of information. Um, so if anybody knows anyone that's interested, I put my phone, my email in chat, uh, have them give me a call. It, well, any other comments or questions? I did have a, I guess, a question for you, Abby. If, if if I am seeing some of these signs, how do I, what's the best way to address it with my loved one so I don't offend them or turn them off or no, that's not my issue. And then they shut down and refuse to get treatment. Do you have any tips for that? Oh, that's a great question, Tara. Also, uh, I didn't put it in, in the uh, slides, but, um, Denial is also a very, very common symptom uh, with most types of dementia. Usually it's the, that individual um, that is in denial that we really do want them to get checked out. It's not the, the, the mom or the loved one coming and say, I definitely have dementia. Look at all of these signs and symptoms. Usually it's not those individuals. Um, and, and so that in itself makes it very challenging to offer resources, to offer help or advice to, to someone that is going through this process of, of memory loss. But oftentimes what I feel works best uh, in my practice is going to that individual and, and trying to, to, to rationalize with them in the space that they're at, whatever they are having difficulty doing, um, don't necessarily really put it in the light of, you know, you are impaired, um, but more so, wouldn't it be nice if we could get you some help to come into the home and, and do some driving and cooking so that could free up some time for you to work more in your garden, or it could free up time for you to spend with your grandkids, right? So, um, pivoting it and, and placing it in a, a, a mindset where let's just try to help you live your best life and not necessarily so much as, you know, grandma, you're, you know, you're getting older and we're, we're starting to see issues. Um, we really need to get you help. Reframe it as let's, let's make your life um, better and, and focus on what you want to do. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Everyone, everyone's different. Also, another reframing practice that I use is um, helping the loved ones around them. So this isn't necessarily for you, uh, mom or dad. This is actually for us. This is helping us. Um, you know, we're, I really want Abby to come on board and, and help with everything so that she can be point person for me. So reframing it and say, it's not for you. This is, you know, these resources aren't for you. This is for, for someone else. I know we had to do that um, with my grandmother. Anytime my mom would walk in the room, it was going to be an instant no, whether it was, do you want lunch or can we take you to the doctor? But if she sent me in first to like pave the way, then it was okay. <laughs> she passed away years and years ago, but we really kind of worked out a system of like, I don't want to say good cop, bad cop, but we figured out how to make it work for everyone. And you do. And with this disease, um, I, again, I always tell loved ones and family members that I'm working with, it's like you're on an improv acting set, 
right? There is never a no. You never want to go and correct someone with memory loss and say, no, it's not February. Mom didn't like, we just talked about this or, or, you know, you, we took your checkbook away a long time ago, whatever the process that they're going through, you say yes. And, um, and you're in it with them and you're what, whatever works to get them to, to continue to be in that, that space where they're not agitated or irritated because oftentimes when we say no or or we do something that we know will cause that that tension they spiral and um, they get aggressive and combative um, sometimes physically combative and and that's when um, you know everything spirals so you just want to figure out what works like you did Tara with your family and maybe there's one person that that person responds to best and you just lean into it and you go with it. Hmm. Abby, those were those that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank and the two you. things I hadn't really thought about were withdrawing from social situations because in the back of their mind they know they can't keep up. Mm -hmm. I've been observing that with somebody in our family mm -hmm. and it it was hard to distinguish between hearing loss or you know, why they were disengaging, but the other things that you added on there <laughs> kind of added up and, you know, um, withdrawing or not doing um, their hobbies that they like. And I bet both of those things are kind of a slippery slope with everything that has had to be withdrawn from their life for the past two years. You know, if, if they're if their hobbies included gathering with other people and then they weren't gathering with other people. And um, so I can see I'm going to need to kind of rethink that because I mean, I hear really well and I'm a really outgoing person. I love being with people, but I'll tell you those first few live networking events I went to, I like walked in and I was like, Oh, this is kind of overwhelming. I think I'm going to go home. <laughs> and so I can imagine if I, I was unsure of my memory, I was unsure of my recall, I was feeling a, a bit self-conscious that, you know, maybe I wasn't going to do it right, say it right, or remember it right, that would, that would be a big barrier for, mm -hmm. for the re-entry. So maybe how can we, how can we help them re-enter or even do reintroduce re some different hobbies that maybe didn't inc don't include gathering as the rules keep changing you know what I mean mm -hmm. those are all wonderful points and I do I want to say with with individuals that are experiencing uh, memory loss whether they're in the mild cognitive impairment category or they're in dementia um, it is a lot easier for that individual to follow a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. if you do have that loved one or an individual, you don't want to say, oh, you know, we haven't been together in so long and it would be really good for this person to come over and have a family barbecue. Mm -hmm. No, try to avoid that really spend time with them one-on-one -on -one and make sure that the environment, A, is some a place that they're comfortable with, which is usually their home. Um, new environments are overstimulating, right? Mm. Um, and then B, don't have any TV or music on in the background. It is really, um, you're giving that person all of the chances to really focus on you. Mm. Um, and, and, you, you bring up another a fantastic point. Again, COVID really has socially isolated these individuals that were at risk for this disease and social isolation. Um, statistically speaking, it, it, it is something that if, if people are socially isolated, the disease will progress faster. Mm -hmm. um, so so with, with that individual that you're talking about, I, I just really want you to try and engage with them, but do it softly, do it gently, um, and try not to overwhelm them. Yeah, because the overwhelm, whoop, like, 
then they check out. Yeah. Game over. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's where the irritation or the agitation yeah. comes up. Um, when you see, uh, individuals that have the, the memory loss and you know, you bring them to an overstimulated place and then they get really angry and mad and, and irritated. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, if you're ever seeing someone that is showing you those signs and symptoms, again, just, um, be on the lookout and, and try your best to, to get them to their primary care doctor. That's always a good, or if, if you don't want to do Mm. primary care doctors, there are, um, a wonderful um, neuropsychologists out there that will come to the home and do an assessment, really which oftentimes better. is a, a much easier sell than mm-hmm. let's go to the doctor's office where they're going to sit you in a little white room and you're going <laughs> to have to do these weird tests for two hours. Oftentimes people shut down, right? Yeah. They, they don't want to go. They don't, you know, the, that denial um, is really setting in. And so it's easier if, again, someone comes to your home where you are comfortable Mm-hmm. And they have this really nice calming conversation while they're doing the testing. So mm-hmm. I would, I would recommend potentially researching a uh, cognitive neuropsychologist. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have a little bit of time left. If anyone else has questions, I don't see any in the chat box, but Abby, if someone is out there listening, like on Facebook and they're not necessarily mm-hmm. in your area, how would they find resources to help their loved ones if they're in say Idaho? Yeah. Alzheimer's.org is a wonderful resource and I can put it into the chat. That's a really good place to start. There are a lot of wonderful um, chapters all over the world that you can start to get information on. And um, you, they have brick and mortar locations that you can go and talk to a social worker, talk to you know a specialty person that really focuses on memory loss. Um, again, Alzheimer's, you know, your loved one may not be actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Actually, technically it's, uh, you have to be diagnosed postpartum with Alzheimer's. Doctors just, um, they formulate and guesstimate that you have Alzheimer's. Um, But again, it's a big chunk. It's that, uh, you know, 50 to 80% of dementias are Alzheimer's um, diagnosed. And so it's always a a really wonderful resource to start that process. Also, most counties um, have, uh, you know, their county aging department that that can also be a really good place um, area on aging um, that will potentially have resources in your county. Thank you. And Adri, I'll just put in the chat box. Um, are there adaptive things in the home we can do for someone with memory loss? That's a great question. Yeah. Tons of stuff. Um, uh, we have a gentleman, Bill, who's in our chapter that does uh, this for a living. There are people out there that will come into your home and, and make it safer from, for fall risks. And, and again, we're talking about individuals that do oftentimes have that vision impairment as the disease progresses, it does get worse. Um, and again, your brain is telling your body to move your arm and move your leg. And that's essentially... Um, Um, as dementia, any dementia progresses, uh, as the brain slows down from the disease, the body does too, which means it's going to be harder to get out of bed. It's going to be harder to go to the bathroom. It's going to be harder to lift your leg. So, um, with someone that's living in their home still, uh, with memory loss, you want to make that house as simple as possible. No rugs, nothing, absolutely nothing on the ground that they could trip on. Even that little lip of the rug, I see it so many times people go down and they fall. Um, And so again, no clutter, no nothing. The the most minimal furniture that you possibly can. You can also um, put grab bars up especially in the shower. Um, You can try your best to have that individual use a walker or a cane while they're in their house. Um, Sometimes that's harder than than others. Um, But again, with, with, with the home specifically, you really want to try and declutter it and make it as simple as possible with nothing on the floor. 
this is when I'm going to pull in Mike a little bit too, that there's a, a great product that can also help support people in the home because his, his robot, his Labrador can bring you your medication. So you don't have to remember to take it. He can bring it to you. So there you go. Nice how we all fit together. Yeah. Minim minimize those quick trips to the bathroom or the kitchen, right? Um, it's the getting up, it's the get it, the sitting back down that could potentially be very dangerous. Um, so if there uh, are any, you know, caregivers, or I'm sure Mike would, would like to talk about his product. I didn't get to hear about it, but I, I'd love to, um, anything can help. And, you know, also you know, I'll jump in too with Mike's product, his cameras, I believe can detect a a, just a change in the gate, right? A shuffling gate. So that might be something to help also identify. Yes. No, just a time. Yeah. And we can, uh, for folks interested, you can check out our website. I'll put a link, but it's um, long-term. Yes. We have this, we have the cameras and we have the sensors on there. We aren't currently doing it with the software, but we have the hardware to look at like the, the motion of someone walking. Um, what's interesting, we're doing partnership with uh, Nationwide Insurance that we just announced two weeks ago on, like, they provide long-term care insurance. And one of the things we're looking at is what are some of the data we could collect when the robot is operating and what you were talking about, Abby, with um, the robot feels those transitions. We feel like we, I just did this in homes and even places that are designed for seniors have some abrupt transitions <laughs> um, when you go from tile to carpet. And so we feel that vibration. And so one of the things that we're looking at is mapping that and or mapping if, if a caregiver has come in and done like a safety audit and has said, hey, move these rugs out. And then, but they're not, they're, those rugs are back in. That's something to, <laughs> to sort of <laughs> um, uh, indicate. So we're trying to find all those sort of indicators to sort of help a better picture together what's happening in the home yeah i'm very excited by all the new products and the technology and everything that's coming out just to to help people age easier that's why we're all here the name of mike's business again it's labrador systems and i can send you that information yeah. adriel yeah i had i had i just on, on what you were talking about abby just based on some family experience is there dimensions that you get into which are they're cognitive, but they're emotional. So that, that you could have like technically very strong memory um, and interaction and, and things, but there's a change in the emotional state, which I know a lot of things can factor, but it's something we've observed in our family where we have an individual that, I don't, that they're more worried, they're more, they get into patterns of, uh, you know, uh, concern like what's going on outside or oh, I don't want to you know the caregivers they, I want to hide my stuff and things and it it's 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 a pattern and I wonder if that's something that you see that is is there social emotional elements of some elements of of dementia or other tracks that aren't that aren't technically dementia it's just really curious because it's for me it's the experiences it's not just about remembering facts there's other things going on with, mm -hmm. with, with yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there is a, a link and a correlation between heightened anxiety, which is what I think that you're describing, right? That that anxiousness uh, of losing control uh, of a, a lot of things, um, but also again, anxiety. If you're seeing it coupled with other symptoms or signs of, of memory loss, that's when we do want to start ruling out mild cognitive impairment or, or dementia. Um, anxiety alone uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's going to be dementia. Anxiety is absolutely a very common symptom and a, um, anxiety disorder is a very common disorder that we can diagnose later in life. Maybe they've never had those issues before, but oftentimes if we're just talking about about the, the anxiousness alone, it is that loss of control, right? Um, where as we age, we start to feel like we're losing control of a, a lot of things that we used to have that power um, you know, over. And, and so that anxiousness is really manifesting because of this loss of, of either, um, you know, control over what, what they're doing in their lives or control over their caregivers or where they're living. Um, so there is a, a huge correlation between, um, you know, 
aging older individuals and that that high anxiety. That's really helpful. Thank you. And because that's our in our case, it's I can't see. I mean, I think the anxiety could be affecting the cognitive, but and how they pro how the person processes information. But it's definitely it's it it, it all the otherwise everything's there. It's just a different filter that they're applying. So yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes, if we are um, seeing anxiety with other symptoms of mild cognitive impairment, the anxiety is manifesting in those pieces where they the that individual has forgotten how to do uh, certain things. And that's where the anxiety is manifesting. You know, um, you, they, they forgot how to manage their medications. And so they got up in the morning and all of a sudden that, you know, they're seeing this pillbox and it doesn't make sense to them. And they're getting really confused. And that's where the anxiety starts to come up. Um, if we're dealing with it in correlation of, of cognitive impairment. Thanks. That's super helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, um, Abby. I think that was all the questions in the chat box. Anyone else before I wrap it up? I'll be sure to share Abby's uh, contact information and her website when I send out the recording. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can always reach out to her. Mm -hmm. But if that is all the questions, I just wanted to share some really exciting events that are coming up. Uh, March 30th, we have MIT's Age Lab. Uh, we have a representative from there coming to talk about their Aging in Place initiatives. Her name is Taylor. She's joining our uh, Massachusetts chapter, which is really exciting. But she runs the Age Lab 85 Plus Lifestyle Leaders Panel and also a program called Omega, Opportunities for Multi-Generational multi Exchange, Growth, and Action. So I'm really excited to hear what they're doing there and how our organization and our members can partner with them. Um, her, I, I think she has a, a special love for our super seniors, the 85 plus. So um, I think that will be the focus of that presentation. We also have on April 6th, our next professional development series with a coach, Wanda Allen. Um, the topic is follow-up strategies that will get you more clients and close more sales. And I don't know about you all, but my follow-up can always use a little help. <laughs> and then our next um, monthly, monthly member meeting um, is always the third Thursday of the month, just like this. It will be Downsizing Made Easier, How to Lose Your Stuff Without Losing Your Sanity. So Jamie Shapiro uh, in our San Diego chapter is going to be running that. So if you're interested in speaking on this platform or any of the other opportunities we have and you're an NAIPC member, send me a message. Otherwise, I hope to see you at the next event. And thank you all so much for coming today. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. It was a great presentation.